Welcome to the Mountain View Church of Christ. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And now, open your heart and receive the inspired word, the spoken word, the engrafted word, the living word. Let the church say amen. amen. Let the church say amen again. Amen. If you don't mind, I, do y'all believe in prayer in this place? Yes. Uh, I hear about two of y'all. Do y'all you, really believe in the power of prayer in this place. If you don't mind, go ahead and stand. I know we've already prayed, but I love to pray. Go ahead and touch the person's hand who is next to you. I won't keep you long. Uh, the bishops told me that they gave me uh, 15 minutes. I think I'm down to uh, 13 minutes and a half right now, so I'm going to shout and let y'all get out. Is that all right? Let us pray. God, we come boldly before you, thanking you for the moment of time. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ, which made this opportunity possible to be able to come and lift up prayer for ourselves and by ourselves. We come bonded with our neighbor, asking that you just bless them, give them all the things that they need and some of their wants. Because, God, we recognize and we understand and definitely believe that if we're praying on behalf of someone else, the blessings will flow to us as well. Hide me behind the cross. Mold me, move me, and use me. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you don't mind, repeat these words. I, I, y'all interactive crowd or, or y'all kind of quiet? I know who to go to to get a shout. I, I know where to go already. R repeat these words. Attitudes. Y'all about a 22, I need y'all to be about a 90. Attitudes, Attitudes. affect atmospheres, atmospheres. And, atmospheres and atmospheres influence actions. Influence I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. Uh, the truth is, is that's the testimony of the Bible. Most of us try to find, uh, blame it on that fine young diva named Eve in the garden. But, but, but I've come to discover that God gave the instructions to a man who then talked to his woman, but then Adam stood by the wayside and let somebody get at his boot. Y'all not feeling the Bible. I understand. I understand. That ain't how the Bible, that's my translation. David, look at, look at King. He sent someone else to go get a woman. Uh-huh. Brought the woman back to the house. Did whatever he did with her. Y'all y'all with me? Then he had the nerve to send the man out to battle to die. But the Bible declares that David was a man after God's own heart. And God blessed him. That is not a prescription for you to go do wrong. C come on now. But when David did it, I can do it too. And we look at Peter, who gave the sermon on the day of Pentecost, who denied the Lord three times. The Bible does not say this, but we see it. He changed. The Bible doesn't say it, but we see it. He changed. If you have a copy of God's prescription, I invite you to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And I will meet you in uh, verse uh, number three. John chapter 20, verse number three. Hear the word. Uh, so Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Verse number five, I'm reading out of the NIV. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb he saw the strips of linen lying there 
well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Verse 8, finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. Amen. I want to preach as a spiritual guide with this thought in our minds. I'm not competing with you. I, I, I'm not uh, competing with you. I just want to take out some time to thank the angel of this house. I believe before the foundations of the earth that JK and his family would be the ones who would lead this congregation with the bishops and the deacons and all of you here. And it is not by happenstance that what has happened allowed this congregation to grow deeper in faith. But at the same time, if we were true to our lives and the lives of others, the truth is, is that all of us have a faith problem. Well, maybe I'll just preach to myself this morning. I know that there are some times in my life when I have a faith problem. Dr. Robert Roberts writes about a fourth grade class in which a teacher introduced a game called the balloon stomp. They were doing an exercise and teaching them about the spirit of competition. He tied to the ankle of every fourth grader a balloon. It was a very simple game, and the instructions were to stomp out other classmates' balloons. I know of you old enough, you probably would have played this game before, and if you don't, I'm going to make sure that you understand how it is played. Whoever had the last balloon tied to their ankle at the end of the game would be declared the winner. The competition was fierce. On an elementary level, it was a reflection of Darwin's survival of the fittest. Because the game implied for one to win, somebody else had to lose. Someone's success depended on somebody else's failure. Everyone playing the game is trying to get something that you possess. Some try to stand on the sideline thinking that if I stand on the sideline, ain't nobody going to come step out my balloon. But the truth is that everyone who had a balloon tied to their ankle got attacked. But in the crazy twist of faith, the one who won the game was the most disliked of all of the students. He was always seen or she was always seen as the class bully. This student did what he or she always did. He or she pushed and knocked people down and stumped out their balloons. I'm going to get you to be where I want you to be in a, in a second. But, but here's where it gets tricky, y'all. Roberts brought in another class. However, this class was unlike the first class. It was a class comprised of the developmentally challenged. I'm going somewhere. These folk were given the same instructions as the regular or advanced class. But when you look at how they played the game, it would suggest that they misunderstood the directions. When they were trying to stomp out the balloons, even if they couldn't stomp them out, you can see the children holding the balloon so that the classmate can stomp out their balloons. Y'all, y'all with me? Y'all with me? Y'all, y'all, y'all not with me. And what they did is they would switch places after they stumped out each other's balloons. So psychologists looked at this and got confused. They really didn't know how to grade or assess the behavior because they were what they were witnessing from this class was not supposed to happen to the developmentally challenged or slow. You know how y'all call the folk the slow class? What do they call it in school now? Yeah, come on, come on, y'all. There's some teachers in this audience. Huh? S special ed. No child left behind. But the truth is, the enemy was in destroying the balloons. But when I reflect on the spirit of competition, we can still see it even in the church. 
We live in an age where the end game is who has the most members, who has the best choral group. How many people I can get to join my church from your church? Whose bi bi building is the biggest and has the most state-of-the-art technological equipment? Our competition ought not be against one another. Our competition ought to be against the balloon which represents the kingdom of darkness. Right. Come on, y'all. It's competition in this place. Who, who leads the ministry? Making sure we don't go against tradition that may not be in the Bible to get a program to reach a level where God will have it to reach. We have all of the foolishness, especially where we work. Uh-huh. He, he knows. Lewis, Lewis knows what I'm talking about. You have all of this foolishness on your job at school, but you would not think that that foolishness would creep into the church. But the truth is, we are the same folk who live in the world. We're just saved and sanctified, but we need to get our faith deeper. I, I, I'm not. This, the, this, this, is this the view? Is this Mountain View? Are, are you sure? Is this Mountain View COC? When you come to worship, we ought to come with one thing in mind only. Giving God the glory out of your life. In psychology, there's three types of comparison, and I'm going to keep it short. First, there's upward comparison. Whenever you assess where you are in life, you fall into one of these three. There's, there's upward comparison, where you compare yourself to someone who is above you. While that may be good, sometimes you have to be careful. Because when you compare your life to someone who has more than you, you get focused on what they have. And you miss out on the gratitude for what God has given to you. We get so consumed with what they have that we forget to thank God for what he has done and more importantly for who he is. I think I stopped by the wrong place. You begin to think as young folks. You got the new Xbox 360, but your mama only gave you three games. And your friends have six games. NBA 2K13, Call of Duty Black Ops, and, and Super Mario Brothers number two. You got the new Madden 2. Well, come on, y'all. This is for the young folk. I, mama, I only got about five Bakagans, and my friend has about 20. Come on, preacher. If you're a parent or an auntie or an uncle, you know about Bacagons. Secondly, secondly, there's lateral comparison. Where I'm not judging myself against people who are above me, but against people who are on my level. The problem with this, Jones, is that it will lead you into a place of complacency. Where you settle for suit suitability and live in marginality. Nobody in the class got hired in the C minus and you got a C plus and you good with that. Wow, come on, preacher. There's still room for growth. If the only litmus test for my success are people who are with you, you will never get to the next level. You need people around you who can pull you to the top. Yes, sir. Preach. Some of y'all, and I do too, you got some of those friends who, who want to remain where they are, and as soon as you try to do something bigger and better, they do any and everything to drag you down. Right. Because they don't want anyone above them. Why you going back to school? You ain't got to do that. We good right here where we are. No, nah, you might be good where you are, but I'm going somewhere whether you come with me or not. And if you're going to talk about me, pray to God for me to get me to that level. This is the wrong place. Some folk get so angry and mad 
because you're not happy with your life. Don't hate on me. Let me motivate and elevate you to come higher with me. Thirdly, 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 thirdly. There's downward comparison. Well, we like to compare ourselves with someone who's beneath us. But, but the truth of the matter is, ain't, ain't nobody beneath you in Christ. I mean, we, we, we have all of these ethereal languages that we come up with. Well, you ain't on my level. You ain't on my level. You ain't making 60 grand. You making 40 grand. I can't even get with you because you 20 grand in the negative. I got a master's. I ain't dating nobody and I ain't going out with nobody because you a high school graduate. Talking about you in the medical field, but you you in patient transport at Baylor. Well, the truth of the matter is that the brother is in the medical field. You just ain't going to date him. We are all the same at the foot of the cross. Beggars who need glory, grace, and mercy. T take that back to the house. You are not above anyone else in here. I mean, they kind of joked about my shoes. I really don't care. I got them on sale. They probably cost less than your whole get up. I'm a bargain shopper. That's just what I do. But Brother Perry said it best. I really don't care whether you compliment my shirt, my tie. It is about what is in the inside that makes you a woman or a man of God. I did this, this is show not the right place. The people who think that there are other folk who are beneath them secretly in their closet have low self-esteem. So in order for you to feel good about yourself, they need to place someone mentally lower than them because they really don't like themselves. The only way to convince me that I like me is to place you above or beneath me. You can always find hateration in folk. I'm, I'm gonna get. I'm, uh, this is about faith. I'm, 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 this is about faith. Don't 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 get it wrong. Well, he ain't in the Bible. He ain't quote no scripture. He ain't in the Bible. Just stick to your seat. Hold on, and I'm gonna take you there. Right, Folk always try to describe what you have by using the word little. On, Look at you thinking you all that with that little car. Who you are when you think you all that with that little job you got. That little title you got. It must not be all that little since you focusing on it. We have the spirit of competition in everything. 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 The square footage of your house or your apartment, the high school, college, graduate law or medical school that you went to, your GPA, your salary or titles, physical attributes, six pack, no pack. If you live long enough, you ask any brother over 50 who had a six pack or even an eight or a 12 pack that sometimes is going to turn into a 10 gallon. <laughs> Come on, come on, come on, come on. Where your chest will drop into your drawers and you'll be have a furniture problem. Because at the end of the day, you may make more money than I do, but you still may not have more favor. 
You might have a bigger house, but that doesn't mean that you're more happier. You might have a nicer car, but that doesn't mean you're going anywhere. Because, boo, if you tell the truth, you ain't got no gas to make it down the street. Come, come on, y'all. I got a new Lexus. It's the LS. Uh-huh. Your car, no, is more than your rent. You got a problem. Riding big and riding dirty ain't gonna mean that you got something in your bank account. You need to live below your means. Uh huh. Let me move on. No, no. Move on, brother. Move on. But come with me to the text. Come with me to the text. We're at the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. The word of the Lord says the woman get there and they don't find Jesus. So they run to Simon Peter and this other disciple to tell them the quarry and quandary. And they see when they get there. And the Bible says that Mary, after going to Peter and this other disciple to share the news, I'm in verse number three. It says they started out going to the tomb. Started out going to the tomb. In the original Greek, the implication, Woodrow, is that they are walking at a good pace. But by verse 4, they are running. Running in verse 3. Something happens between verse number 3 and number 4 where they stop walking and start running. It is as if with as, as closer as they get to the tomb that they could not take their time. There was something within them that made them accelerate their pace. Some of y'all can take y'all time getting to Jesus. But when you've been out there long enough, out there, wherever out there is, when you've had shattered dreams and broken promises and sleepless nights you will accelerate and start running to almighty God I know some of y'all want to act stuck up but we gonna wait we, we can wait for y'all but if, if this ain't for y'all if you need God on a Saturday night and you somewhere where you know you should not be you can call on if you in the Lord I'm still in the text. Take off running, but watch where I park. And the other disciple beat Peter to the tomb. Now, if you like sports, you will notice whenever there is a headline of a story in the sports section, they almost always give the name of the winner. I've never, never, ever, ever read a sports article where the winner's name wasn't mentioned. I looked at Lester Day last night. Oklahoma withstands late TCU rally, holds on for 24-17 win to clinch at least a share of the Big 12 title. Baylor picks up seventh win of the season in a 41-34 victory over OSU. But when I read the text, there seems to be a journalistic faux pas in the text. I said faux pas. <laughs> the term is French in origin and literally means a false step. I, I, I'm with you. Because the one that won does not get his name called. The text says... He's the other disciple and the one that comes in second gets his name mentioned. Maybe God is showing us something about the spirit of competition. That you can't judge yourself based off of who got there first. Just because they got there first doesn't mean that they won. You can get there first. I just want to get my name called. 
Is there anybody in here other than this broken preacher who can say, let them get the car first, let them get married first, let them get the house first, let them get the promotion first, let them get the elevation first. I just want him to know my name. Tell your neighbor, neighbor. Oh, that's about two of y'all. Neighbor, he knows my name. I didn't get there first, but he knows my name. The other disciple gets there first. And I like how the NIV puts verse number six. When Peter arrived, they, they, don't, they don't know when to shout. The other disciple outruns him, gets there first, but Peter arrived. The other disciple runs faster than Peter, gets there first, but Peter didn't stop because he didn't get there first. The text says, when Peter arrived. You need to thank God that even though you saw some other folk pass you, you saw some folk getting blessings before you, you ought to praise God that you arrived. It may have taken a long time. Some sleepless nights listening to that favorite love song. A whole lot of patience and prayer. A whole lot of tears, heartache, and pain. But because you were faithful and did not quit, you arrived. And you know how you arrived? You're here right now. And that's enough to shout about. You know, the devil can't stand you because he thought you would quit if you didn't get there first. He thought that you would give up when other people who started after you, because sometimes there are people you will start off first, they'll start after you, and they'll get the promotion. Have you ever been on a job? You've been there five to ten years, and they bring in some little, uh uh-huh, y'all know what I'm talking about, somebody new, and they got the audacity for you to train them to be your manager. And you at work tripping. I can't believe this. She ain't even been on the job for three weeks and they got me teaching her how to do my job and she gonna be my boss. Station identification, let me go on and teach you. Your job is not where you get your glory. I I think I need to come talk to somebody. God allows you and I to be in the workplace, to go to school, to have a piece of your right mind that you think it may be your left mind, to be able to have an impact on other folk to lead them to the Lord. I know, I know, I know. You just trying to get a promotion. I know you got baby shoes to buy. Christmas is coming up. You want to work a lot of the OT. God is saying, I'm going to allow you to struggle on that job until you tell somebody else about the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, this, 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 this is the wrong place, brother. The Bible says, and then sometimes you got to go there, that the race is not given to the swift nor to the strong you can keep pumping weights working out doing all that eating right and still die but it's given to them who endure to the end I'm just trying to help a couple of few folk in here late arrival does not mean denial did you you hear what I said A late arrival does not mean denial. You can start off second and still win. Okay, I'll prove it to you. Let's travel back. I was in D.C. in a meeting, and that brother, you know that brother named Barack Obama? Y'all remember him? Y'all know what I'm talking about? The dude who, you know, don't vote it. Don't vote for him. No, the first time, brother. Don't vote for him because he's a black man. Y'all remember all that hoopla and then they start tripping off the birth certificate. He ain't really black. He wasn't born in America. Hillary started off first. Barack got into the race second. But when he arrived, he was the president of the United States of America. 
last time I checked. I'm just trying to help somebody. The economy may be whipping you, but the first thing that I came to tell you is that you need to just hang in there, baby. Hang in there, brother, because one day you will arrive. Y'all, y'all know Peter. I, I'm, I'm about to cut across the field who messed up. But he wasn't a mess up in God's eyes. You know Peter. You know Peter who cussed out the little girl. You, come on now. You know Peter, the thug who carried a switchblade knife cutting off folks' ears. Peter. Some of y'all. Well, Peter, what well, the Lord had to say, get thee behind me, Satan. Peter. I want to just talk to somebody who's not too stuck up to admit, yes, I disappointed God. I may have failed and made some mistakes in God's eyes, but I'm not a dumb decision nor a bad mistake in God's eyes. Let me tackle the text from three tapestries. Point number one, point number one, and I'm going to be at y'all. Good morning. Don't allow a rival to make you careless. Don't allow a rival to make you careless. What do you mean? Don't get happy just by arriving. There is more to life than just getting into the Lord Jesus Christ, saved, sanctified, on your way to heaven. God would have you to exercise your faith and do some work and do some work and do some work and do some more work and do some more and more work. And all the work ain't left up to the bishops. And all the work ain't left up to the deacons. All the work ain't left up to the folk who in the educational system, maybe they don't want to teach in here. Maybe their talent is being creative. I said, I need you to teach. You so good in DISD and Lancaster ISD. I don't want to teach. That is why people experience burnout. I'm in the text. The other disciple gets there first. I, I want you to see this. I wanted you to get a mental picture of this. He stands and stays or bends over and looks into the tomb, but he's on the outside of the tomb. Now, bending and looking, the text says, he saw something. Bending and looking. He saw something. He saw the linen cloth and bending and looking, he gets satisfied that he just arrived. He saw enough. Getting there allowed him to see something. But when Peter arrived, he does not stay where the other disciple stays, outside the tomb. The text says he arrived and decided to go on in. Because he sees the same thing the other disciple saw by bending and looking from the outside. Y'all see what I'm seeing? But because Peter went in a little deeper. He saw something the other disciple did not see. This text says, both saw the strips of linen, but only Peter saw the napkin or the kerchief or the handkerchief. Because you can't see the napkin by just arriving. The only way you're going to see something deeper is you got to go in. It's not enough just getting into the watery grave of baptism. It's not enough just getting yourself buried in the water. You have to have a relationship with Jesus. You got to go through some stuff to prove to yourself, not to God, that you have faith. This, 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 this is the wrong place. This is... Listen to the text. It says, to go in, you got to bend over. I'm going to come back to that. Maybe... The other disciple didn't go in because it takes too much work to go in deeper. All right, too much work to change. Too much work to stretch your faith. Too much work to accept God doing more in your life. 
Too much work to get rid of a habit. What you see is enough to satisfy you. Now, I'm going to leave y'all alone. We, we need to be like Peter. Yes, sir. I mean, this is a living witness example here in the Bible. I just don't want to see something on the outside of glory. I want to see more than I see. And the only way you're going to see more is to go in deeper. And I ain't talking about dive in it. Well, that's not what we're talking about. We are talking about having a deeper level of faith. Some people are glad to just be on the edge. They're glad just to be close. I'm good with it. You know how they act. I'm good with it. Nah, nah, you know. And now they say, I'm Gucci. Huh? What's all of that? I'm Gucci. What? Is there anybody in here who can say, I'm tired of praying that same prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray my Lord to so you, If you're still praying that as an adult in Christ, you need to quit. Sometimes in prayer, you just sit there and start crying just because of what, not just what he has done, but because of who he is. You can't pray that same prayer. I'll accept that from a child. But a grown adult, been walking with the Lord three, four, five years, you praying that? Point number two, don't allow arrival to make you comfortable. The entry to the tomb wasn't on eye level. Because if it was, the first disciple would not have bent and looked. The, the text don't say that, but you, you just, it makes sense. It, it was here. So he bent and looked. It was not on eye level. In order to see more Peter had to bend over too. Sometimes, I'm going to help somebody. It may appear that God is breaking you. You might be at a point where you want to give up. I'm tired of giving. I'm t- they giving. I'm they taking all that I got. I'm at the church building 24-7. He's not breaking you, but God is really bending you so you can really see him. If you still standing up tall right now, I ain't talking to you. And I ain't being rude. But for the folk who have been bent, who've been through some season in life where you felt like quitting, God says, I'm only bending you so I can help you to see me. Sometimes we don't see them because too much stuff is going good in our lives. But I I got good news. If you get touched by the word, you will become a gossiper. I know. Gossiping ain't good. I said, if you get touched by the word, you will become a gossiper. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. A gossiper is a person given to gossiping and divulging personal information about others. That's why you can say all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. You are a gossiper. I'm, talk- I'm not talking about negativity. I'm talking about when was the last time you told your co-worker about the goodness of the Lord? You, you so busy talking about, uh, I, I'm just going to be cordial with her. I'm going to take the staircase. I'm not going to take the elevator. Trying to avoid people. God is placing these people in our lives so that we can have an impact on them so that they can get in Christ. You tripping off of the person. Or you you got to pour love on it. Let, 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 let me move on. Let, let me move on. Sometimes God will allow some things to happen in our lives. That accident wasn't God breaking you, but rather God bending you. 
The death in the family wasn't God breaking you, but rather bending you. That punishment that you got for not cleaning up your room was not God breaking you, but rather just bending you. Peter bends over, goes into the tomb. By the time he gets into the tomb, he can straighten up. Watch me, watch me, watch me. The bending seasons in our lives will not last forever. God will straighten out your mind. The Lord will straighten out your family, your finances, your future, your job situation, and even your health. Peter goes into the tomb, straightens up, and sees something the other disciple did not see. He sees a folded napkin. The Bible says, I am never a waste for words. John, who sees Jesus as the son of God, goes into great detail to describe the napkin. The napkin or the kerchief, as the Amplified Bible says, used to cover his head, not lying with the other linens, but separate, neatly folded by itself. In Jewish tradition. If a napkin is left open on the table, it signifies that whoever is in charge, that I ain't done. It's the same thing you do when you out fine dining. I know y'all still going to Rally Burgers, Checkers, and Mickey D's. I get it. I understand. They were talking about only going to Taco Casa, but they ain't got that at Taco Casa. I know you thought it was just good manners that your mama and your daddy and your grandmama taught you to fold the napkin over your lap. The open napkin says, I want more. I'm not done. Come on, preacher. But if the napkin is folded, <laughs> neatly it means I'm finished. That all I should have made some of y'all shout. Peter goes in and when he sees the folded napkin is evidence of a word that the master had spoken. The last thing that Jesus said on the cross was it is finished. When Peter saw the napkin, he saw evidence that if Jesus promised it, it can and will be fulfilled. God told me to tell somebody in here, if you, if, if, if you go deeper, God will show you evidence of what he has promised to do. Is there anybody in here? And I know you, I know you, I can talk to you who, who can say that I've got some folded napkins that are evidence that he'll sustain you, that he will come for you and he sure enough will heal you. I have some folded napkins that are evidence that he will lift you, that he will elevate you, and show enough will provide. I'm headed home. Don't allow a rival to make you unchallenged. I'm in verse 8, and I'm gone. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb also went inside he saw and believed the other disciple gets there first got careless got comfortable got unchallenged gets there first watches Peter go in now the text does not say whether Peter what he did of what he said to homeboy that made him want to go in. Well, now, this is just a little exegetical supposition. Maybe he heard Peter shout. Maybe he heard Peter say, hey, homie, you need to hurry up and get in here and look. You know how we do. You need to come look at this. Look what I got on my iPhone. Y'all know y'all be looking at them pictures. Come, come on. Come on. Don't lie to me. 
Maybe he heard Peter say, hey, bro, you got to come check this out. You ain't going to believe what I see up in here. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Maybe. (laughs) Peter did something to make the one who was careless, comfortable, and unchallenged go in deeper into desire more than he had witnessed with his naked eye. That's why you ought not act stuck up to folk who might need to shout and clap because that ain't what you do. If that ain't what you do, cool, sit there and just listen to it. But don't try to control what God has done for me. You don't know how this week was. With all the stuff that's been going on on my job, in your house, with your spouse, you need to come in here and shout. But if you ain't thankful and you a silent worshiper, go on and just sit there and be silent. Don't make what's law for you law in my life if I ain't sinning. Perry, I've discovered the resurrection is for people who come in second. If you've always been on top, this ain't for you. This this ain't for you. Is there anybody in here who's honest enough to say, I've been bent in life. I've came in second place. You know what? Second ain't all that bad. If if you read your Bible. The first Adam couldn't handle the sins. But when Jesus came as the second Adam. The first testament needed a bull, ram, and goat's blood. The second testament, as long as I got King Jesus, I don't need anybody or anything else. Let me touch on this and I'm, I'm, I'm gone. I, I'm, I'm gone. Let, let, let me touch on this. J.K., in, in the way that he <clears throat> is, we, we, we came across each other in the, in the bank about two weeks ago. And he said, well, brother, I'm, I'm having surgery on the 27th and I, I'm going to need you on the second Sunday. That's December the 9th. Well, I get a phone call and says, well, I need you this Sunday. You know I'm having surgery. And I said, yeah, this Sunday. He said, well, we're trying to do some things and, and build and, and grow. And he said that <clears throat> our goals don't match our God. I'm quite sure he has told y'all that. Y- y'all heard that from his lips? Our goals don't match our God. That, that, that we are faith challenged. <clears throat> and so I said, well. I can either try to come up with something real quick, give you something that I got, but still touch on that. And I believe that giving is deep. And and, and hear hear me well when I talk about giving. Because most of us associate giving with just, you know, the pocket, what, what I got in the bank account. God want that too. You hear me? God wants that too. That's two of y'all. You and her, because she nodding. You not. That's four of y'all. God wants that too. We we no. I'm all right. It's all right. They just a little long. It's all right. We give to God based on what we believe about God. They, they didn't hear me. We give to God based on what we believe about God. But the question is, is what do you believe about God? God won't do in miracle what you can do in muscle. Yes, miracles still exist. 
but there is no miracle worker except the Lord. Don't get it twisted. Let's be real. But what are we really talking about? Whether it is a building program, gaining deeper faith, it all centers around stewardship. I want y'all to get this. Stewardship is using God-given abilities to manage God-given resources to accomplish God-ordained results. When you think of stewardship, you, you, like I said, we, we often think about money. That, that's given of your resources. But giving money to the local church is not stewardship. It is merely a part of stewardship. H hear me well, hear me well. Though you can't be a steward without giving of your means. Well then, if stewardship ain't about giving money, maybe it's about ministry. Giving of my abilities. But what you do in ministry for God is not stewardship either. It is a good part of a being a good steward. And you can't be a good steward without giving of your abilities. Wait, wait a minute. But, but if stewardship ain't about what I give, it ain't what about I can do, then what is it all about? I'm glad you asked me. It is about having the heart of a steward. In other words, good stewardship is a matter of attitude that stands behind your giving and your service. That's why attitudes affect atmospheres and atmospheres influence actions. When your attitude ain't right, your giving is going to be broken. When your attitude is wrong, you ain't going to serve in the church. You can give all the money in the world and not be a good steward if you don't do it with the right attitude. You can serve, be here 24-7, open up the building, close the building, change the temperature of the water. But if you do it with the wrong motivation, it does not matter to Almighty God. If we're going to be good stewards, I need to make up my mind. You need to make up your mind. We need to come together and understand <laughs> that a good steward, it means an attitude of ownership. A steward is someone who takes care of something for someone else. I don't own my money. I don't own my time. I don't own my possession nor my relationships. They're all his. They belong to him. I just manage them. If I master this attitude, I will become a good steward. Is there anybody in here this morning who, 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 who has never named the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? I, I know we say we got to hear and believe the gospel. That, that's true. That, that's true. But you got to believe that Jesus died for your sins. That's the main thing. Jesus died for my sins so that I might live. You, you got to believe that. It, it's just that simple. Then you got to change your mind and change your lifestyle, which is a process because of the truth was told and you pull back the curtain on all of our lives. Some of us still doing some crazy stuff in Christ Jesus. But if you used to club every Saturday, every Saturday, every Saturday, and now you only going two times a month, you've changed. And so you ought to applaud yourself. I'm not asking you to clap, but you ought to praise yourself for that, that you are making some changes in your life. You are not who you used to be. If you used to cuss every time somebody wanted to talk to you, 
Never, even when they wasn't being negative, you just wanted to cuss because that's the kind of spirit you have. And now you think about cussing, but you don't cuss. You ought to applaud yourself for that, too. If your skirt used to be up here and now it's a little bit lower, you ought to applaud yourself for that. Come on, y'all. Because some of y'all, two steps, two inches from the club. And you sitting in the back. I, I ain't looking. I ain't looking. I ain't. But it's the truth. How, how many of y'all? And I'm, I'm, I'm close. I'm, I'm done. How, 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 just be honest. And I got my hand up because I already know what I'm going to say. How many of y'all? have just begun to start really giving the way you ought to give. Come on, just, just, it's cool. It's okay if somebody looking because the truth is, is that they ain't gave the way they always used to give. Don't nobody want to raise? I, I got two, two honest folk over here. Okay, okay, I'm going to come down your street. And not only am I going to come down your street, I'm going to pull up in your driveway and I'm going to sit and watch what you got on TiVo. I, I'm going to talk to you. If you still are dropping in five and twenty dollars and you ain't filling out an envelope. That means, and I'm going to turn my back because I know some of y'all going to look at me crazy. That ought you that what that means is I'm not accountable. You don't need to know what I'm putting in it. Be careful with how you give to the Lord because God will circumvent some circumstances and will snatch your whole bank account and you will find yourself giving all of your money giving all of your time I'm, can, can I be real with y'all I used to be that kind of giver why well, drop in a little bit of something I'm good with that you ain't got to worry about me putting in 10 or 20 percent no track record of what I'm giving. You cannot keep giving the Lord change. I expect that from children. You cannot, it's not about will a man rob God? It's not about robbing God in money. It's about time, talent, and treasure. I'm just trying to challenge y'all. Is that alright with challenging y'all? Be accountable. Ah, you went to Black Friday and dropped a cup for hundred dollars on something that you got on sale for two hundred dollars. But when was the last time you just blessed the Lord with a two hundred dollar bill? C come on, y'all. You ain't dropping nothing in the basket since the last time you dropped it like it was hot. Come on, come on, y'all. I used to be the kind of giver where I would sit on the back row. As soon as the benediction was gone, I was gone. You couldn't find me. You, you wouldn't go find me. I used to park around the corner so you didn't even know I came to service. Okay, you ain't too far away. You park by the gate. It's the same. He hear me, he hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. We... We, we cannot be cheap with God. If God was being cheap with your life, you wouldn't even be here. The fact that God is allowing you to breathe his air, wear some of his clothes that you bought with his money. Sometimes you ought to just come and give your last. And thank God that I'm in a position now. Not, and I don't give this way just because I'm on the microscope. Because if you, if you preaching, you, they, they know what you're putting in. Start writing checks. Put your name on the envelope. I mean, there ought not be single dollars and fives and tens in the collection plate. It just shouldn't. I, I, I expect that from a child. Because yeah, they ain't working. But for grown adults, you need to budget and give the Lord his off top. And if you're a teacher and you get paid once a month, the bishops expect to get it at least once a month. I, I'm with that. Don't, don't
don't don't don't let God put you in a situation where you end up hurting on your giving. And I'm not just talking about money. Y'all think I'm talking about money. I'm talking about time, talent and treasure. Y'all ought to be a working congregation where you ought to be able to get to know somebody that you don't even know. I don't like her because she got longer hair than me. The truth is she only got bag number five. It ain't even real. It's cool, though, but that's okay. Get to know the person who's sitting next to you. I cannot call you my brother nor my sister if I don't know you. You just come here. Believe that Jesus died for your sins. Repent of all your past sins. Confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Go down into the water grave for baptism for the remission of your sins. Not only to have your sins remitted, but to be able to have a walking, living, talking, testimonial relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you live right and you die right, heaven will be your home. If you're here today, you say, you know what? I have not been challenged. My faith has been stricken and tormented. I ain't giving the way I need to give. You ought to just come and just ask for special prayer because the prayers of those who are righteous get through. Availeth much. Get through. Get answered. Wherever you are, why don't you come as we stand and sing the song. This message was brought to you by Mountain View Church of Christ. Visit our website at mtviewcoc.org for more information about what we're doing and how you can be involved in ministry and spreading the word of God. Believe. Become. Belong. Come out to the Mountain View Church of Christ. mtviewcoc.org.